Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. You've just tuned into Women's AM this morning. I am Ayan and joined, uh, joining me this morning is Sister Nusrat, Sister Hannah, and our special guest today, Sister Sidra Shokat. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back, sisters. So, Sister Sidra, uh, um, so, uh, your um, uh, assistant program officer for the Muslim charity, um, what does that mean? <laughs> Actually, I'm the assistant program officer in the project of orphans and vulnerable children. Okay. So I basically deal with the Muslim Charities project, which uh, basically sponsors the orphan and vulnerable children around the world. We are working in a number of countries, um, and we are basically collecting the people like sponsor from here in the UK or anywhere in the world, and uh, sponsoring the orphan on their behalf. So, uh, and th that's basically dealing with. Uh, sometimes it's like orphan sponsorship just deals with education and their food and the other one is Hibze Quran sponsorships so that deals with the Hibze Quran all the aspects of that and Alhamdulillah we are now uh, on sponsoring ab about 1500 children all over the world mashallah. and yeah they are on, uh, most of some of them have already completed they have the Quran mashallah. mashallah and they are enlightening the society with mashallah. their knowledge yeah. so do you do you get updates with the children as well do you follow what they're doing yeah alhamdulillah we get the progress report on like every six months and we send it to the donors and then we personally one of our colleague or like whoever deals with it they go on the ground meet the children we get the photographs oh, we mashallah. can contact them over the phone and if the sponsor does want we do uh, contact, uh, give them contact details, and if they want to visit them, actually, that could be done as well. Oh, mashallah, yeah. that's really beautiful. Yeah. So you yeah. can actually meet the child that you're looking after. Yeah, alhamdulillah. That's really that's a really beautiful thing because sometimes people don't have that opportunity yeah. or feel that they don't have that yeah. opportunity to actually meet the child that they're sponsoring. So it's yeah. really beautiful, yeah, mashallah. Yeah. Mashallah. So alhamdulillah. Without further ado, let's get on with the discussion in her views today. The refugee crisis is one where you cannot read a newspaper or article or even turn on your TV without seeing it reported. While much reporting continues, the attitudes on how to respond to such a crisis, as well as our attitudes towards the refugees, are point, uh, were our point of moot and contention both from government policymakers, academics and members of society. So what is our duty towards the refugees and how should we respond? As always, this is a live discussion, so please do share your comments and questions on this topic. The number to call is on your screens now. Now, or you can tweet us at Islam Channel hashtag YM15. So, uh, you know, Subhanallah, we see a lot within the media. You see some positive stories, a lot of negative stories. You know, so, uh, you know, first-hand accounts of what people have been going through. And you know, we see the terms, um, you know, refugee and migrant have been used inter interchangeably. But what do these terms mean? How do they differ, Sister Sidra? Actually, they differ a lot. They, they shouldn't be used interchangeably. Um, immigrant is a person who willfully leaves his or her country and they have a mean to meet their family while they are going to get their belongings uh, to plan their actually visit to the other country to plan their uh, home to plan their employment everything and they, they, they go for the better life that's it or to, to earn more uh, and that's the immigrant refugee is a person who is forced to leave his country he hasn't got a chance to take his belonging he hasn't got a chance to meet his family Family. Sometimes he lost, he, he loses his family. So they are entirely different terms, and the crisis which is Syria are actually refugees. They are not immigrants, actually. I mean, Subhanallah, you do see it a lot in the media. You know, the whole the whole debate because you you see a lot of people getting very heated about it, saying that no, they're migrants. Some of them are not even people who are fleeing war zones. You know, and and, and some people saying no, they're all refugees because every country that they're coming from has some sort of instability. I mean, Sister Nusrat, Mashallah, you're a writer and, and a law graduate. You know, what has this meant for you looking think, at these sort of I debates? Part, when we kind of look at it from that perspective, a lot of um, the confusion we have is based on some what we see in the media when these terms are used inter interchangeably they do have implications mm -hmm. on our perceptions which can sometimes um, aid or aid and fuel prejudice but when we look at the term refugee yes as uh, sister Sidra mentioned it's defined as a person who's been forced to leave their country due to some form of persecution natural disaster or to escape war and in actually looking at this many people sometimes don't look at the legal documents that actually define this kind of status it's a 1951 convention actually relating to the status of refugees and their um, legal rights and obligations that's 
that's a key legal document as that's defined by the United Nations. So when we look at actually what describes a refugee, it's actually very, very detailed, which a lot of people generally don't seem to look at. It's defined as a person who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality and is unstable or owing to such fear. Um, is unwilling to avail himself in the protection of that country or who not having a nationality or being outside of the country of his former habitual residence as a result of such ev um, events or is unable owing to such fear return to it so it's very it's not as um, black and white as people actually um, make it out to be it's a lot more um, it's a lot more complex than that whereas migrants are people for perhaps that go to a different country whether that's for economic reasons or just because they fancy a different climate there's actually a difference in that kind of thing and many academics have actually said that it's because of this interchangeable use that has led to a lot of people forming opinions that generally tend to sometimes contribute towards stigmatization and vilification. Yeah, but as a panel, you know, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, when we see certain terms being used, you know, we don't realize how much of an effect it has on us subconsciously in the way that we look at things and how our attitudes are formed towards certain people. And this is very much so the case. You have people who, because of the fact that migrant was used instead of refugee, they, they, they actually are very, very abusive in the way that they respond to the people who are coming over into Europe saying like, well, they're just here to kind of steal our jobs, steal our yeah. benefits, you know, these people should stay in their countries. Or even, you know, the reverse sort of uh, a reaction if they do recognize them as refugees mm -hmm. are saying, well, you know what, they should stay in their countries and fight because when we've had, you know, our world wars, you know, we didn't leave the country, we, we, we stayed and fought. But sometimes they don't really realize what the impact that has on people, especially, you know, when it comes to women and children who are having to go through this crisis. So, um, Sister Sidra, what kind of impact has this that had on the women and children? Oh, it, I think that so the most vulnerable are children and the second comes women. And, and it's recognized in every society that they, they are the most vulnerable people. Uh, the children and women are affected a lot because when it's come to fighting, as all of us know, men are like dead. So they die because men of the, died, yeah. So most of the children are left either orphan or with a single mom. So they have like and children can't go to the school. They can't. They don't have any uh, um, food. They don't have any anything anything which a child w should have, which uh, which is a children's right to be. Uh, they they don't enjoy anything, and they are always in a fear of shelling. And th because they are so traumatized that uh, they uh, they can't like they can't enjoy anything. You know, um, we have in Muslim charity sponsored a few Syrian children that are on in Lebanon actually in the refugee camp. And I personally lo know a girl. She is just seven year old, and and she was so traumatized that she couldn't get into the Lebanese school. So we, uh, with our partners, treated her for two, two years. Can you imagine? Like she was in such a trauma that she went into the informal school for two years just for a. F to, to get to her be able out. To, to be able to, you know, be within... Be other, socially, interact yeah. with other children. So now, alhamdulillah, this year, she has joined the formal school, alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah, you know, this is one of the things that we kind of overlook, is that post-traumatic stress. Mm. You know, it has a massive effect. Maybe, you know, they were lucky enough, alhamdulillah, not to have been harmed by what's going on. But we don't know about how that would affect anyone, whether it's a woman or a child, mentally. I mean, mm. uh, Sister Hannah, what, what other sort of, uh, you know, impact do, does this crisis have? have on women and children. Yeah, I mean, as you were saying, you know, earlier you can't switch on the TV without seeing all of the images coming out from the refugees who are trying to get into Europe. And, you know, it's just conveying sheer helplessness, you know, and, you know, devastation, obviously, at what they've gone through. I mean, we remember the the image of um, oh, yeah. little Elan Kurdi that, you know, first sparked um, a lot of this debate. And, you know, even a week later on, another girl was found, you know, a young girl was found dead on the shores of Turkey again. Um, so just the journey, you know, that migrants are having to refugees are having to go through to get to Europe is traumatizing enough let alone the experiences that they've previously had um, and you know the extent of the crisis is what is intensifying it specifically you know in this case it's not like with other wars where it's just you know one single from in one single country in one single area and people are fleeing that people are coming from Syria from Iraq from Afghanistan also from you know places like Libya um, you know because of just the general instability in the region for so many years and the fighting that's been continuing there um, as for women specifically the impact that this is having on them you know some language barriers or you know employment barriers are often facing women 
women when they arrive even in refugee camps in the desired European country that they're traveling to, which are obstacles from them, you know, progressing further, having, you know, gone all of this way to finally get to their destination. Still, there's obstacles there for them. There are reports now coming out that, you know, even in a refugee camps in Germany, you know, there's rape and sexual assault, you know, they're rife amongst women and children because obviously, you know, it's, 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 they're, they're not, they're, they're in an extremely vulnerable situation, especially if they're traveling alone, um, as Sister Sidra was saying, you know, awful. if their men folk have died. Um, and, you know, this is such a big issue in our time because it's not solely one where, you know, like any other crisis where you can give charity. Um, you know, majority of the refugees, when you see their interviews on the news, they would like to return home. They're not as we were sort of, you know, coming back to our discussion about my, the difference between migrants and refugees, they're not economic migrants where they're coming to seek a better livelihood. They've been forced to go, um, you know, be removed from so their Pamela, homes. because you, you see what they say, you know, when they've been interviewed, some of them have said, look, I'm an engineer back home, yes. you know, I'm, I'm a doctor back home, I'm a teacher back home, but they won't be able to be those things when they come into Europe because, you know, there are so, you know, the, the system is so different mm -hmm. that they may not be able to use those qualifications that they had in order that, for that they've been using to support themselves back home when it was more stable. They may not be able to use that when they come here. Yeah. You know, they, it's a whole change for them or even just the, the, the issue of security, like you mentioned, subhanAllah, it's, it's devastating, you know, the fact that they come from, you know, an insecure place into another insecure situation. You know, what can be done to help them? And I think that's one of the things when we look at, you think, subhanAllah, how, what can I do in this, in this situation? I don't know what I could possibly do. And I think that's one of the things that you get from this... Um, like you said, the sheer helplessness that comes across when you see them on the news and in the media. And, you know, I remember seeing uh, an article, subhanAllah, of a woman who basically, uh, you know, just went into labor. As soon as she got off the boat, she, she you know, she, her feet were, you know, hit shore. She started to go into labor. SubhanAllah, you think, you know what? So many women, so many children have grown through so much to get to where they are. And then sometimes they're met with, you know, aggressive behavior, with, you know, rudeness, with, you know, and it's such an unfortunate thing because you'd feel that, you know, if, some, if you were in need, people would be out there to help mm. you. But inshallah, we'll come back to this discussion and we'll discuss it further. We have to pause this a really important discussion to go for a quick break. But don't go anywhere But because when we return, we'll be asking what we can do to help in this crisis. And before we go, here's a reminder of this week's competition. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Women's AM. This morning I am joined by Sister Nusrat, Sister Hannah and Sister Sidra. We are continuing our discussion on the refugee crisis. And subhanAllah, you know, we've talked about you know, the interchangeability between the terms migrant and refugee and the impact that this crisis has had on women and children. But when we look at, you know, people's comments, you know, after, you know, news articles or even people just generally what they're saying, because you see a lot of people saying things in a lot of platforms and, um, um, we see so much vitriol against the refugees. I mean, why is this? Um, the reason why this is essentially boiling down to two reasons. Misplaced and unfounded fear rooted in capitalist mentality and also this media sensationalism, which is also used for political expediency. But I'll talk about the first one first. Um, because we live in a society that values people, as mentioned earlier, for the contributions they make in society, people only see themselves as being individual, therefore not caring about other people's problems. And so when you're faced with a crisis of people um, being refugees to your country, you'd be like, what kind of contributions are they making? Are they doing this? Are they doing that? So we value people in terms of monetary gain. But if we gave actually that opportunity for refugees to come and make something and hustle the way everyone else hustles, you'll probably do a lot of wonders. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is the media sensationalism. But going back to what I was saying about how we use terms interchangeably, this is actually used tactically as a way to create that kind of sensationalism where we now live in a society where the climate is fostered for us to, um, what's the word, gain, um, normalize the vilification of people who are economically and politically vulnerable. And then people use the um, excuse of, oh, well, what about our own homeless people? What are people doing for that? To, to put it quite frankly, a lot of the people that advance this kind of, these kind of um, 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 defense mechanisms, really, it boils down to prejudice. They're just using the fact that homeless people are British-born as a way of, of emasculating their prejudice under faux concern. You don't care. You, don't, you just really want to just use them as a base for that. And because the media do that and can use those words interchangeably and foster that climate of hate, politicians, some politicians at least, use that for political expediency in order to gain electoral support for certain things and certain aims. That is essentially what boils down to. 
You know what? You know that's that's a really good point in the sense that you know because of the fact that you know media is using it interchangeably, it is like spurring on this feeling that people already have about you know foreigners, people coming in from war zones. You know, there's always these stereotypes, especially where you know the, where it concerns the, the countries that they're coming from for Syria and Iraq, especially with all the talk of you know of of, of uh, rebels and all of these things. People are saying, oh well, we don't know who's coming into the country. We don't know what they're going to do to our country, and they kind of miss the bigger picture here. Mm -hmm. in that you know there are human beings fleeing for their lives it's not a case of we don't know who they are because at the end of the day everyone that lives in this country you don't know you probably don't even know who your next door neighbor is how do you know how do you not know that there's some sort of deviant you know mm -hmm. you don't know that so at the end of the day you do this based on the fact that you want to help other people so unfortunately you do see that being used as a reason not to allow people into the country. So, subhanAllah, it's, it's such a sad thing. Um, we do have a caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, sister. Assalamu alaikum, uh, sister. Just a topic about the refugees. And uh, I would like to mention that, uh, yes, everybody should take a part in and help that the European others. But I wonder and feel disappointed what our Muslim countries doing about it. Mm -hmm. And some are wealthy countries. And I've spoken in Saudi, Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, so many Gulf ones. And I feel sorry they can very easily find if they take just a little, I'm not saying a lot, because language is the same. And they give them that opportunity to settle nearby there. You know, many ways of land, and when they settle, they want to go back. It's easier, even they feel some similarity. Mm. It's, it's good enough to say people feel apprehensive. I know people feel apprehensive. I'm Muslim. Muslim myself, and I did come from Pakistan. It's not I've been born here, but I can understand when some how other people start feeling as well. I'm not saying we should all take part in it, and it's not good enough to wash hands and just leave other things because it's not good enough. All right, well done, Germany. You took it that many. We will make the most. That's not. It's essential time. It actually to look after them now. So that's my old point. Uh, Hope that's it, my message. Thank you very much. Jazakallah, sister, for your comment. I mean, the sister makes a point there that you know, a lot, a lot of Muslim countries are probably not doing as much as they could to help with the refugee um, crisis. But if we look at countries like Jordan and, jo and, and, jo and countries like Lebanon, they've taken in millions of refugees. I think it's the it's to, it's it's talking about the fact of what can we do on an individual scale as well. Because unfortunately, you know, we're we're not in control of you know the government and its policy but we are in control of our own actions so it's about looking at what we can do individually as well so subhanallah you know we're in a position because we are here in this country that we have the means and the tools to be able to do something about this crisis especially that we're here and they are coming over here as well we're able to do something about it um, so subhanallah the sister makes a really valid point I, I feel but um, you know but when we look at you know our duties towards the, the refugees, what evidences do we have, you know, within the Qur'an and the Sunnah about taking people in? Um, I think there's a, quite a few cases, I mean, I think, mashallah, the sister, she made a really good point, and I think the Islamic position of how we should be treating them, um, which, as, you know, the sister mentioned, lots of Muslim countries are not doing, you know, that's enshrined within the Sunnah and within Islamic history. I mean, obviously, one of the biggest examples um, was uh, when the Hijrah occurred, um, when the Muhajirun and a group of Muslims who were being persecuted in Mecca, when they made that Hijrah to Medina, where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa established Islam in the city, um, Muhammad said, you know, he paired one migrant with the local Ansar uh, and he made them brothers and they were expected to share their homes you know so many of the Ansar you know they gave away like half of their wealth they took it like so literally because they wanted to truly you know be they, they viewed them as their brothers um, not as refugees not as migrants but you know as as themselves um, and they were willing to share everything with them um, and throughout then Islamic history, there weren't the traditional cases of refugees um, as we would see them now, because um, during the era of Islam, you know, we don't have the concept of borders and nationalism, you know, uh, people are allowed to move where they wish to freely, not, you know, pre prevented by what are actually just lines on a map, really, aren't they? Um, 
we're familiar with the story about the woman who, you know, she was pretending to uh, cook for her children who were crying when the Khalifa, um, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he passed and he saw um, these children crying and he asked the woman why are they crying and it was because there was a famine um, in Arabia at that time and so refugee camps had actually, you know, they'd come, they'd sprouted around Medina um, but this woman, she didn't have enough food to feed her family so she was pretending to cook for her children just to pacify them but Umar ibn al-Khattab, see the Khalifa, who used to patrol these camps of Medina which, you know, is a huge contrast to the actions of many people, especially the rulers we see today, he then went to the straight to the state treasury, the Bayt al-Mal, and he got the ingredients and he cooked for these children himself, subhanAllah, and he didn't leave until they were hungry, um, until they were happy, sorry. <laughs> they weren't hungry anymore, alhamdulillah. And last one, um, which I just think is an extremely interesting one as well, given what we were talking about in terms of some of the ways people view refugees. Um, there's been quite a lot written um, in, within academia and history about the Jews who were expelled um, by the Christians from Spain in 1492. Um, and even though they were not Muslims, the Khalifa um, gave them abode in the Islamic State during that time. Uh, Sultan Bayezid II, he wrote a letter to King, Ferd to King Ferdinand, you know, condemning the fact that he'd, um, exp you know, expelled these people. Um, and he said, you know, you've impoverished your own country, but you've enriched mine. And I think that's the attitude, subhanAllah, that, you know, we as Muslims have to other people, that you're not a burden, you're not, you know, just going to drain on our resources, you're, inshallah, going to contribute. And even the fact that they weren't Muslim, you know, they were welcomed and very harsh measures were put in place against anyone who would try and um, harm them. Harm them, yeah. Or just and these, these are the principles that Islam teaches us and I think sometimes it's so easy, especially when we live out here, to kind of get sidetracked and think about, you know, just me, myself and I. You don't think about, no, as a Muslim actually, I have a duty, an obligation to help those who are less fortunate than I am. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really beautiful to hear those examples, subhanAllah. And, um, and uh, you know, it's one that we hope that, inshallah, we can all have, inshallah, if we don't have the opportunity now, to actually find that opportunity for ourselves so that we can actually, you know, yeah. reach out and, you know, a hand to our brothers and sisters, whether they're Muslim or not, to be actually able to help them to improve the conditions of, of their life, inshallah. So jazakallah khair for that, sisters. As members of humanity, and especially as Muslims, we have a duty to ensure that those in dire situations can be given relief and the help that they need. In the society we live in, where there is much emphasis placed on the individual, it's most important that we exhibit the good nature from our exemplar Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This has been a, ma a really informative discussion, but if you've missed any of today's show, you can catch a repeat at 11 p.m. or you can catch up with the highlights from this week on Sunday at 3 p.m. Or alternatively, you can also catch us on YouTube. Take a look at this clip to find out how to do that.